Okay, fantastic. All right, we got a great guest today. Just wanted to introduce you to Neil Schwartz Mastermind. We have our guest with us is Jennifer Matsumoto. Fantastic job. I want to share something that uh, I hadn't shared publicly, really. I, we had a little talk about it before, earlier, but uh, Jennifer has been working toward a fabulous goal um, joining the club of the million dollar production agents. She finally this year has gone over a million dollars and she's got plenty of properties in pendings right now. So let's give her a big hand. Good job, Jennifer Matsumoto. Woo! Look at that smile. Love it, love it, Thank love you. it. Okay, fantastic. So Jennifer, um, we you started in, in the, our Irvine office. What year? Do you remember? Two thousand. Well, no, two thousand eleven. Eleven or twelve, right? Oh, yeah. Whenever right. you guys write, write, and, write and, when you open. And and exactly. And um, no children at the time, as I recall. No children and um, good production, but wanted to get more. Wanted to do more. Was always looking to do more. So kind of take us a little bit through that progression um, since 2012. Um, and now we have three wonderful children. Is that yes. correct? Yes. So, and, and for many of these years, you've been doing this production really without any buyer's agents or any um, secretarial help, right? Yeah. So this is my first year with buyer's agents. So, right. so tell us, uh, walk us through it a little bit, 2012. Um, okay, so when I first started with you, I was at about 20-ish transactions, maybe 20, 25 transactions, um, lower price point, and you're right, I didn't have any kids, and then pretty quickly after I started, I had my daughter, who is now nine, and then I had two others, which is two boys, seven and five, so um, during that time, my goal was to increase my production and increase my price point. So that's kind of what I've been trying to focus on is increasing, just being more efficient with everything. And so I could be present with the kids as much as possible, but then also have a good production level. So I um, now this year, I am at a little bit over 50 transactions and like you mentioned, my GCI is higher than it's been. And I have a, an assistant who is awesome. And then also Liz Nemechek is on my team now and she is a buyer's agent. And so the three of us work mainly together. And then I also do use um, Holly for marketing, my marketing coordinator stuff. And then I have a really awesome TC that I use. Fantastic. Very, very good. Okay. So business in the beginning came from expireds for sale by owners, just listed, just sold, things like that, correct? Yeah. Right when I started, I was, um, I got introduced to the Mike Ferry system pretty early on. So right away, I started doing all of the, yeah, expired, just listed, just sold, door knocking type stuff. And then probably about six or seven years ago, I started doing the farming. And so I, you know, I have my COI and all of that. But in addition to that, I started farming. And that's been really, like, that's really helped me with my business. Right. So uh, kind of what you've done, as I, as I perceive it here, is uh, the, the digital strategies, um, inclusive of the, the farming, etc., and then old school selling techniques, you know, you need to know what to say and how to say it, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you got a very strong foundation there. And then a little bit of predictive analytics. If you do enough of this, you're going to get some of that. And that's kind of how that works for you, correct? Yeah, I think for me, what really has worked is I, I even before real estate, had a sales background and was not afraid to make the calls and do all of that type of 
work. Um, and so I feel like kind of incorporating a little bit of both. So now I do coaching with Tom Ferry. So incorporating the hard work and the hitting the phones and the calling and that type of stuff, which is very much Mike Ferry's way. And then doing some of the farming and the social media and that other passive, a little bit more passive stuff and kind of incorporating both has helped me a lot. Yeah, for sure. That, that blended combination. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So let me ask you this. I mean, are there any particular books? What do you do with your mindset? How do you keep yourself in the game? You, you, um, you know, you have three children. Uh, you worked straight through till, you know, within weeks of, of them being born, correct? I was actually negotiating while I was in the hospital and <laughs> doing some contracts and stuff while I was in the hospital. Right. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then you, you gave birth to three children. You got a fantastic husband. You guys right. work together on all of that. So you, you do that, you invest your money in real estate. You've been doing that almost since the first time I met you. Yeah, I had um, been doing a little bit before. And then over the years, we've been getting into it more heavily. Right. Got it. Got it. Um, so you look at this more encompassing as a, as a whole business, not just the making of the money, but looking at it as a, 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 a really an en engulfing your personal life, you're, you're a terrific investor. Uh, we've had lots of conversations <clears throat> over the years about different strategies and different things. And you've done a terrific job with that. You come across deals so much more often than, than I see most other agents. Um, and then you work to take advantage of them. You want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, what goes on in your mind? Uh, you, you look at it. Let me ask you this. Do you look at a listing as a investment first or as a listing to get income first? How do you look at those properties? I think it depends on where we are in the stage of our investing, right? Like whether we're looking to acquire or not. Um, but I think First and foremost, I look first at what makes the most sense for the client. If it looks like they can net more money and they're willing to put in the money, I'll let them know that. And I'll, I come to them with, as an agent first, with these are your options. You could either sell it as is and get X number. You could put a little bit of money into it. And since I have that background, I can tell them you can put 10,000 or 12,000 into it and you'll get this much more, or you can fully remodel it and you'll get this much, but your net will, you know, we look at the net, right? Not necessarily how much they put in. Sure. So some clients are saying, yeah, I'd rather put in that money and I want to walk away with the most. Okay. I'll help you do that. But sometimes they'll say, I don't want to have to deal with any of it. I just want to sell it off. And I don't, or I don't have the money to do it. I just want to sell it off. In those cases, if they're going to sell it off anyways and not get that profit and it's going to go to some other investor or somebody else, then I'll look at it and say, okay, is this a deal that I can make work for us? And as an agent, you know, there's different ways to structure it. Um, I've had clients that have done seller financing for us. I've done different kind of creative ways of making the deal work. Um, but I'm always very upfront with the clients to let them know, these are what the options look like. I will be the buyer in this situation and you don't have to sell to me just because I'm your agent. I don't expect or even want you to do it for me as a favor. I want it to make sense for you as well. So I try to be as transparent as possible. And then if it works out, great. And in a lot of times it does work out and they are happy to figure out a way to make it work for both of us. Got it. Great. So you, you, are what I refer to as a deal maker. I, um, I think that's one of the things that I try to do is I spend a lot of extra time <laughs> thinking about how to make a deal work, whether it's for me or even in a transaction. 
I feel like a lot of the transactions that we put together is because it's sometimes necessary to think outside the box and sometimes necessary to not just do the black and white easy transaction. Sometimes it's like, okay, well, how can we make this work? My buyer wants it. You guys want to sell. How can we make this work that both of you are happy? Got it. Very cool. What percentage of your business comes from your past client and sphere base and then the other areas that you're getting business from? Um, good question. Um, I would say that about, if I were to look at my numbers, about 25% of it is past client sphere. Um, probably another 25 is um, somebody finding me somewhere, whether it's on social media or online. And then I mean, my math is not going to be good, but probably more, maybe about for of the remaining 50%, probably, um, I don't know, maybe 30 something percent of that is farm. And then the rest is just random, whether it's referrals or um, absentee owner or things like that. Got it. Okay. Um so let's, so years ago, you specifically went out to pick a farm. Talk, talk to me about that. Tell us, I mean, what were you looking for? What was important to you? Um, how much time, effort, and energy do you put into that? Um, you know, is it a, a quick turnaround financially? You know, because you're know, looking, looking at you right now, it's like, whoa, let's do that and go down that street. That's okay. Okay, but what did you put a lot of time, effort and energy and money into developing this? Yes, so I first started out, um, so I had already sold, so majority or a big portion of my farming business comes from um, Tustin Meadows, which is a community in Tustin. And so I had already been selling a few homes in there, mainly getting the listings from door knocking and um, calling through calling within that community. And then so, and then I noticed that one, there was an older agent that was in there that wasn't, that had a good portion of business, but wasn't doing it all. And so I figured, you know, one, he's getting older and two, he is male and I am female. So we're not going to be the same and people can tell us this apart. So um, since I had already had some sales in there, I was kind of comfortable in there. So I started doing just a portion of, of that. It, Tussa Meadows can kind of be divided into quarters. So I just started doing one quarter, which is uh, like 250 homes. And then I started door knocking the whole community, but only spending time mailing to that one, community, one section. And then I started getting more traction and more listings. So then the following year I opened it up and I did the full community. And then now, I do all of that community and then now I'm spreading out and doing surrounding communities around Tusta Meadows and even going into surrounding communities in Irvine. So I'm trying to spread out as I have more time and capital to do so, and then more track record to support the cost of all of the marketing that I'm doing. Right. So what are you spending now for uh, more or less? Right now I'm about probably $4,000 a month. Got it. And that would be farming, all my farms, my COI mailings once a month. So I farm for all my farms. I do it every two weeks, send out something every two weeks by mail. Or if I um, don't have, well, I prefer actually to drop instead of mail. So I used to do during the pandemic, I did EDDM, but um, I actually prefer to drop mainly because my thought process is if even though having something dropped to the door may be kind of a hassle for me and for the consumer, um, the time that they take to get that piece of postcard or mailing drop piece um, to take it off their porch and walk to the trash can, they're looking at it 
or it's by itself. So even if they don't look at it, they still see that it's me and then they're walking to the trash versus if I mail it to them and they get 20 other marketing pieces, whether it's real estate or otherwise, they're just going through it and sorting trash and not trash. And so the time and a, you know, that they have my attention or that I have their attention is less. So I have found that actually dropping it um, is more effective, but that is just a little bit more of a hassle to deal with like the people that's dropping it and coordinating the drops and stuff like that versus like sending it to the printer and the printer doing the EBDM stuff. Right, I understand, I got it. And the drop is less expensive, as expensive as is the, um, is, it, is there a significant drop is like a couple cents more. So okay. I think I, I pay her 21 cents per door. And I think I can get EDDM for, I don't know. I, I don't remember all the numbers for EDDM, but it's less than 21 cents a door for sure. Got it. Okay. All right. Perfect. Let's shift gears to the past client and sphere for a little bit. How do you manage? Well, this is a dual thing. How do you manage the leads? I mean, you're getting to do 50 deals, 60 deals a year. You have, you're, you're, you're getting how many leads to do that? So good question. I do not know my numbers as well as I should. <laughs> um, so for my past clients sphere, my goal is to do what you tell me to do, which would be to call, call quarterly, mail monthly and email weekly. weekly, but I do not do that. I do probably mail monthly, email every other week and call whenever I have a chance, which ends up being one to two times a year. Got it. Um, I think that when I do, like what I try to do is I try to call more, but I just have not had the time. But when I do connect with my clients, I try to make it as meaningful as possible. And one of the things that I've been working on this year is um, that has actually helped a lot is really showing my appreciation for the business that I get. So whether it's at a closing, giving a closing gift, or if I get a referral, I, I do a gift in the beginning to say, thank you for giving me the referral. And then once we close, I give them a second gift to say, hey, we closed. Thank you again for thinking of me. Um, so I try to do a lot of that type of stuff to encourage the referrals so that even if I'm not calling all the time, it's still impactful once I do connect with them. Got it. So what kind of money are you spending on these gifts? Not yeah. a lot. Um, I mean, it depends on the person and where they are and the type of lead that I'm getting, right? Like if I'm getting a referral for a million and a half, then it might be a little bit more than if I got a referral for 600. Um, but usually it'll be like a $25 gift card to Target or somewhere to say thank you for even thinking of me and giving me the referral. Um, and then at closing, I might give them another gift card. Or if it's somebody that I know would really appreciate food, then I've actually been doing like portos a lot and it just mails to their door. And so I don't even have to think about it. So it's just a bake at home type, you know, portos bakery got it yeah so uh, then i thought um, that's what you said but it wasn't sure yeah so then it's just easy and like they just it's a surprise they get it at their door and then they just you know like it's something that they can enjoy or share with other people because it's so much and then they can talk about it or whatever but i i've do, done a lot of that lately god good excellent um so You've got the leads. How do you how do you follow up on them? I, I it's um, you know that's that's a, one of the big questions, especially as you get multiple leads and multiple transactions going. Mm -hmm. it's how do you stay on top of that? You have a like a special um, CRM or so? Um, no, I don't have anything uh, special. Um, like what I use is I use Top Producer. It's very old, and I've thought about changing. I just I'm not one to change a lot once I'm comfortable with something. Um, so what I do is I'll put it in top producer and then um, I'm still very, very old school and very not tech savvy. 
So I have my planner here okay. and I'll just write down who I need to call when I need to call them. So if I talk to somebody on a Monday and they say follow up on a Thursday, I will make a note to follow up that Thursday and make sure I do it. And then, um, though, so anybody that's kind of a hot lead will automatically go into my planner and I'll just keep following up with them every week or two weeks. Or if they say, call me in a month and I'll call them in three weeks and I'll just write it down in my planner. So I don't forget. So anybody that's in my planner, I really don't forget about, and I will follow up diligently people in my top producer get Get forgotten about sometimes (laughs) if I'm not good about following up. Right. Um, and checking my top producer. Got it. Okay. No, it makes total sense. If you don't have it in front of you and you're not comfortable with it, it's going to get lost. Yeah. Right. So the way you're working it, they tend not to get lost, correct? Yeah. So I'll have them double. They'll have be in, like if it's a somebody that's going to sell, they'll be both in the top producer with a uh, time, timeline to follow up. But if I'm not checking that regularly, Either way, they're not lost because they're in, like the basics are in my planner, which just says call Tom from Mission Viejo, right? And then if I need to go into top producer to get the more details of who Tom is, then it's there. Okay. Um, Tell me on the the past client and sphere stuff that that you are working, um, do you do any gifts or things for them at the end of the year? The, The... people that send you more referrals than most? Yeah, for sure. For people that send me more referrals than most, I do. Um, Like right now, what we're working on is, so every year I try and, before I was actually giving gifts to people, not necessarily people that I had done in that year, but just within the last few years, I would give them all a gift. But then it became too many and I was driving around too much. So then last few years, what I've done is just gifts for um, people for that year. So if I did a transaction with them that year, then I would give them something. This year, we're doing something a little bit different, which Adina, my assistant, has been help, really helpful with, is we're doing like a little, we did an ornament for everybody that closed. So it says your first, so every buyer, your first house, and it says the year and their family name or whatever. Um, and so Christmas ornament there, yeah. and then they she got like these little mini cute little Christmas trees from Trader Joe's, and so I'll be dropping those off. And then um, for sellers, if they're local, then I'll still drop something off with something similar off to them. If they're not local, depending on how far they went, I may send them something. <laughs> <laughs> got it. So, yeah. Got it. That's great. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so you're all involved clearly in your real estate business and you're all involved with your children. We talk about this all the time and the experience that you're trying to get. How do you balance all of that? You know, um, how's that work for you? Yeah. Um, it's a challenge and there is definitely mom guilt. Um, last year when I was, when during the pandemic, I was working pretty much all from home. And so I did not have an assistant at the time. In the very beginning, I was just training a new assistant and then everything shut down and I didn't feel comfortable with, um, working from home and then how I, you know, business was kind of unpredictable in in terms of like what was going to happen. And so I didn't keep on my assistant last year. So last year I was, I did 42 transactions, but I was running around like crazy and leaving birthday parties early, my own kids' birthday parties early so I can go to a showing and things like that. So at the end of last year, I was like, very, something needs to change. I need to have more balance. I need to, I want to be more present. And so Um, I started coaching with Tom Perry and we worked on kind of what does that look like to have balance? What do, what do I really need? And so I brought, like I talked to you about, I brought on my assistant, um, another full-time assistant. And then I reached out to Liz who I'd already done some transactions with, but like not consistently. 
And so we started working together and that has been amazing. So usually my schedule looks like I'm working in the week during the weekdays. And I've always, I mean, I'm always really good about responding and calling back and, you know, doing that kind of stuff, but physically being at showings and stuff, I don't do very, very rarely. So evenings now I have back and weekends I have back. Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, that's, that's, uh, and making good money. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> very cool. Um, but sometimes you don't, I mean, you're very good at getting back to people. Um, you're, I mean, you're just terrific about connecting, etc. But there's probably days where you don't feel like it, right? Yes, there are days that I don't feel like it. What, what do you do on those days when you don't feel like it? Because the truth is, you got good money, you're smart with your money, you know, you're not you're not worried about where the next house payment's coming from or, you know, how to pay for the kids' schools. You know, you've you've been making over five hundred thousand dollars a year for the last three years. And last year was seven and some change, and this year's, you know, over a million. So, and you're very conservative with how you spend your money. So it's um, there's a little bit of complacency that could enter in here is what where I'm going with that. So how do you pick yourself up, up and go do this on a daily, weekly basis, Jennifer? What's your secret? So I think a few things. What, number one is I'm very um, client focused. So I really care about what my clients think and what my clients like. I try and put myself in their shoes. So I know that people, I don't like it when I don't hear back from somebody when I'm waiting, right? So I try and put that kind of mindset in. So if we write an offer, if I don't hear back from the other agent, I will still throughout the day, text my clients and say, hey, I haven't heard anything. I know you're waiting. I'm continuing to follow up. I'll keep you updated. Or if we're in contingencies all removed and, um, you know, there's nothing to report to my clients, I'll still check in with them. So like things like that, I'm really good about doing. One of the things that I heard once is there should never be a time that your clients call you asking for something. The only time your phone should ring is when somebody new is calling you. And I really like that because it's, you know, it's true. Like your clients should never feel like they have to call you and ask you a question. You should always be trying to call them or give them the information before they have to call you and ask. And so that's one of the things I try to do is even when I don't want to work or even when I don't feel like, you know, following up with people and doing that type of thing, it's my job and I need to do that. And that's the level of service that I commit to for my clients and for the team. And so um, that's kind of my commitment. Uh, if you're going to be my client, then I'm going to educate you and I'm going to keep you informed. So that type of mindset is what I have. In terms of complacency, um, yes, I do get complacent. And whenever I get complacent, I start, I'm very competitive and I start listening to podcasts or um, when I get too stressed out, I stop listening to podcasts because um, then it stresses me and everybody else around me because then I start calling my husband, we need to buy more property. Um, but so I listen to bigger pockets a lot, which is the real estate investing podcast. And so that always motivates me because it's like these people that have, you know, hundreds and thousands of rental properties and they're financially free and they're able to sit on the beach in Hawaii and that type of thing. And so I listen to that and then I'll get more motivated, but literally Every time I listen to that, then it's like I call my husband and I start calling lenders and I start saying, we need a buy. So, yeah. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, so is there a, well, let me, let me do it this way. What, what do you think your superpower is, Jennifer? How would you describe your superpower to your daughter? I think always trying to go above and beyond. 
always trying to do my best for whoever it is or whatever project I'm working on. So, and putting myself in their shoes in every situation, whether it's negotiating a transaction or getting a house ready for market or even seeing if they should sell, right? Like I am a huge believer in holding on to real estate. So if I can tell my clients that it doesn't make sense for them to sell and that they should hold on to it because the market's still going up and they could have a lot of great equity, then I tell them that. And so I think the honesty of it and the, you know, they could see that I'm trying to help and they could see that, you know, I put myself in their shoes or, you know, I'll give them the same advice that I would give my parents or my, uh, my friends, like that type of thing, I think translates into my business. And absolutely. Absolutely. You're using a pre-listing package still? Mm-hmm, I do. You use it every time? Yeah, every time. Every time. Interesting. Every time. Yeah. Interesting. And you think that sets you apart from other competitors? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what other competitors do, but it's just, I drop off one every time. And it's just, I think, shows who we are as a team and who I am as, you know, a professional. So I just always drop it off. I didn't always do it in the past, but in the last several years, I have definitely every time. And if I can't reach them, I have a digital version of it that I'll email it to them. Um, But most times I can, I have enough time to um, drop it off or have it mailed to them. And again, if they're not local or I can't get it to them, then I'll email them a digital version. All right, perfect, excellent. Very good stuff. You open to a few questions? Yes. Excellent, okay. So Jennifer Matsumoto, uh, Josie, go ahead. I'm ready, hi. Hi, Josie. (laughs) Nice to see you again. Yeah, so I've known Jennifer since I came over to Irvine, or before that actually, and I am an early morning person and her with her three kids, she's there before I get there. Uh, Starts work early, you know, she probably has to go to PTA meetings or something during the day, but she always comes back. (laughs) So she's got a great work ethic. I want everybody to know you have to work hard. Thank Thank you. you. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Jesse. Good job. Who else had a question? I have a question. Go so ahead. many questions. Thank you, first of all. Um, so my first question, obviously, is um, what is your schedule like? Um, and then my second question is, what would you suggest for an agent that is getting started in Irvine right now? And um, my last question is, may I please have a copy of your pre-list package, the email version that you send out? So, yes. Please, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, yes, email me and I'll email you the pre-list. Okay. Um, so what I do it lately is I've been, um, cause not all the people, so if it's into my farm, they kind of already know who I am. So it's not as much of an introduction that I have to do, but sometimes if I'm getting just like a random call or referral, then I have to kind of prove myself a little bit more. So I'll do my attached PDF of a pre-list. And then I'll also, I've been, um, doing either a link to my Google, um, my business page, or my Zillow reviews. So then it's kind of like, here's my packet. This is what I do. But also, if you have any questions or you're interested in seeing some of the experiences that my clients have had with me, here is a link to see the reviews. So I'll do both. Um, Schedule. So this year, I have been trying to, or not trying, I have been going to the gym at five o'clock in the morning, which is new for me. Um, So I go to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday at five, get back at 6, 15, help get myself ready, help the kids get ready. And then I usually leave for the office between 7.45 and eight, depending on like how rough of a morning it is for my kids. Um, and so then I'm in the office and then I'll usually work straight until, um, usually it's like five o'clock, but lately my kids have had earlier soccer practices. So I'll stop around four and then 
do soccer stuff and then phone calls. But like I said, with Liz being my buyer's agent, it's been awesome because all of the evening and weekend showings for buyers, she'll do. If it's a listing presentation, then I'll figure that something out. And then my husband will take the kids and I'll do a listing presentation. So schedule wise, that's what I do. Weekends, same thing. If it's listing side, then I'll work it, whether it's a um, listing presentation or, well, Liz does the open houses. So, but I think like if it's a bigger listing or a listing in my farm where I feel like I need to be present, then I'll go do those. Otherwise she'll do the open houses. Um, and then your last question was farming um, or in Irvine, what would, I, what would you do? If you're new in Irvine, what I would say, if I were new starting out, I would do absentee owners, calling absentee owners, because I think that that's a really good opportunity there, especially right now in this market. Um, and then I really do wish that I would have started farming earlier in my business. So I started in real estate in 07 and I started farming about six years ago. And I, like I mentioned earlier, I feel like if you have the work ethic and you can do both, meaning you are not afraid to make the calls and you have the solid foundation of following up and calling and doing that hard, hard work, then it's nice to also have the passive stuff where you don't always have to necessarily prove yourself and justify who you are. Like on expireds, every call you're making, they don't know who you are. So you're constantly having to say, well, I'm Jennifer, I've sold this number of homes that, you know, and trying to prove yourself. Whereas if you can do both and you already have a starting to set up a farm, they'll start calling you eventually. And then they know who you are. And it's, kind of, it's a different thing and it's nice to have that too. So I would look into doing a farm. Awesome. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good question. Hi, Jennifer, this, this is Michael. Uh, I just want to congratulate you on your kick Hi, Michael. Here. Thank you. Really good. <laughs> Listen, I got a question. When you started in 2007, I think I spoke to you before, did, did your mom business, they influence on you when you started? My mom's business? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so my mom's a real estate agent in Sacramento and, um, uh -huh. yeah, she, even before I got into real estate, she wanted me to get into real estate. Um, and she knew I had a really big interest. The reason I got into real estate was because I wanted to be an investor and I knew a lot of my mom's friends were investors who did really well and had a lot of passive income and that really excited me. And so, um, her friends and her influence kind of helped me get into the business. But my mom is, I love her very much and she's a great agent, but she is very, very much the traditional old school agent that just works off of referrals and referrals. <laughs> so she doesn't make any outbound calls. Thank you very much. All right. Perfect. Good. Thanks. Good question, Michael. Other questions for Jennifer, please go ahead, Abigail. Jennifer, I'm so curious to know how many properties you own. So we own nine in California. Wow. And then we own 55 doors in Pennsylvania. Wow. Good girl. Yeah. Amazing. Good job. Good job. Good job. Okay. Um, other questions? Hi, Jennifer. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah, hi. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how you blended, you know, your old, um, you know, traditional hitting the phones and doors and kind of with your, you know, a little more of the Tom Ferry kind of new school stuff? Yeah. Um, so now, to be honest, like my business is mostly the Tom Ferry stuff, mainly because I just have not made the time to do as many calls, <laughs> but in the beginning I was doing a lot of, um, a lot of absentee owner calls, a lot of just listed, just sold calls, a lot of like, I'd get a list from my, um, title reps and then I'd call in my farms and door knock. So like I had a very, very strict schedule as I was trying to build up my farm. So because I wanted to, so the, the Mike Ferry is very much calling outbound calling all the time, right? 
So I was like, okay, I don't have a problem with doing that. But I just, like I mentioned earlier, don't want to continue to have to prove who I am and like introduce myself every single time. And I'm like against five other agents that they have no idea who they are either. And everybody's just competing. Um, so what I did was I, I still did the outbound calls. I still did the absentee owners and that kind of stuff. But on the side, I also set up farming so that that passive stuff, once I got that system going, will just go out every two weeks. So then that way, if somebody calls because they're getting my postcards and stuff, great, I can have that business, but I'm also spending my time, most of my time doing the calling. Because it doesn't take that much time to get the farming stuff set up. Once it's set up, it just kind of goes. Okay, so do you like follow up, like say you, how you said you do the drop mail every two weeks, do you kind of call that, you know, that quarter and say like, oh, you know, just calling to see if you got my, you know, So I do, you, no, I don't. I mean, okay. to be honest, um, <laughs> I do also do events within. So like I'll do like garage sales and stuff like that. So I'll call specifically for those reasons. Hey, I'm going to have a garage sale. I want to know if you want to be a part of it. And when I'm, when I have extra downtime, I will call into the farm or door knock in the farm and say, Hey, you know, this is Jennifer. I'm with century 21. I just sold the neighbor's house down the street. We had five offers. It ended up selling for $25,000 over the asking. And, and so wanted to see who, you know, that might be interested in selling. Right. So like, I'll do that. I'll door knock that. And in the beginning, I have not door knocked a lot this year, but in the beginning I would, and I mean, this is just even in the last two or three years, um, I was doing door knocking every two, two days, every week. So, um, Mike Doyle, the other agent next door, he, him and I would go door knock and we would either do it together or we would just call and know that each other is doing it. And so like every Monday and Wednesday, starting at nine o'clock in the morning, we would go door knock. And so when I would door knock, I'm door knocking in my farm so that they're getting to know me and seeing me. And that way I'm also building up my database. So I'll, if they're not interested in selling right at that moment, if it sounds like somebody that one is very personable or that could have information or is in the future looking to sell, then I'll tell them, Hey, I, a lot, a lot of the neighbors ask me to keep them up to date with the sales activity within the community. I'm more than happy to update you as well so that you can see how a, uh, your neighbor's sale is affecting your home prices. Would you be interested in that? And then they'll say, yeah. And so then I'll grab all their information and now I'll call them on a, you know, supposed to be quarterly basis, but I'll call them um, and I'll have all of, so that's how I built up the contact information for my farm. What, what most people only heard Jennifer was you made a lot of money or you make a lot of money right now. What they didn't hear is for since 2012 to let's say two years ago, three years ago, you were door knocking, phone canvassing, phone calling, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't hear that part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I do. In the very beginning, getting everything set up, I did a lot of you know, when we would have the phone blitz, I would be out there calling, or even if we're not doing the phone blitz, I'm in my office calling through my database or calling on um, just as just sold stuff like that. So lately I haven't had to do as much. I probably, I mean, not probably my coach still wants me to, and Neil still tells me I need to make the calls. I just have not done it as much as I should, which I'm sure if I did, I would do better. For sure. For sure. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, I don't know if we have a hard stop, Jennifer. I, I appreciate your time. It's one o'clock uh, right now. And I always like to go into something just after this. So everybody unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. Let's give her a big round of applause. Woo! Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer this well is Good question. In, in life. In life, we're either a warning or we're uh, an inspiration. And you are, you, when you look up inspiration, you see a picture of you in the dictionary. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for all of your support. I do. Neil, yeah, I still have a question for Jennifer. Of yeah, course. me too. <laughs> <laughs> so Jennifer, I want to thank you for taking care of that referral. You know, um, Jennifer is great. Um, she looks very soft, very gentle, but she's very strong. You know, I <laughs>
expert or buyer to her. And that guy said she would not sign buyer broker or recommend anything, but he happened to buy in, wants to buy in Jennifer's um, personal area. So I referred to her and uh, she did convince to them to sign the buyer broker agreement and close the deal. It's 1.4 million something, right? 1.4, yeah. Yeah, and I heard great things about her. And just thank you very much. Very good, very persistent, very powerful lady. And I have a question for you. You said you have um, one assistant, full time, one TC, one buyer agent. So um, do they all work from home? Uh, buyer's agent works from home. Assistant works from the office. I work from the office. TC works from home. Holly does my marketing and she works from home. I see. Okay, very good. Thank you. And also, uh, how do you saw, do you have anybody, your clients or referral, that ask you for kickback? If do, how do you respond? Um, so, Yes, there's buyers that will ask for kickbacks and I definitely right now will not do. If, I mean, depends on the price point and, um, and if like I'm getting a second transaction from them, like if they're selling and then buying, then maybe I'll do a, a reduced commission. Um, but if it's just a straight buyer, I will not. And the reason I tell them is because right now it's really competitive in this market and who you hire really matters. And you may find an agent that will reduce their commission, but that means you're probably not going to get your offer accepted because they just mm. don't have the negotiation skills to get your offer accepted in this market. And if there's 10 offers that we're competing against, the agent that you hire really will make a difference because the agent on the other side will look at that agent's experience and decide if they want to accept your offer based on the experience that they think that them and their client is going to have working with you. So because of that, we get our clients offers acceptance and we will look out for your best interest, but we're not able to do any reduction. The other thing is I tell them just kind of like Yvonne, your client, um, your, the referral you gave us, gave me, um, I tell them right now I have, and this year I've closed four or five deals that were off market. And I found my clients buyer or um, property to purchase that were not on the market and they didn't have to compete. And one of the things that makes us different is of course, we'll look on the market and we'll help you find the right home if it's on the market. But if, if you need something and it's not on the market, we will also spend time looking for something that's not on the market for you. And because of the connections that we have with other agents, we can, we've been able to do that for our clients. And so like your guy, that was an off market property too, so. Yeah. Yeah, got it from the off-market deal. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you for your uh, share. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, who else? Jennifer, congratulations. If I can get my question in here. Hi, yeah. <laughs> Hi, so good to see you again. I know, nice to see you. Uh, I know it's been a long time. Uh, thank you so much for sharing everything with us. And I have a question for you. Just which podcasts, there's so many out there, you know, as you know, which are your favorite in the real estate investment that you use to motivate you and keep you focused? So I really just listen. I mean, um, so mainly what I listen to right now, because I don't have a lot of time is um, Bigger Pockets. That's the main thing, uh, which is the, like the Bigger Pockets now has like a ton of different branches of um, podcasts, but it's the main one with David Green and Brandon Turner. Um, so that's what I listened to. The other things I was listening to, um, he's in your area. What's that guy's name? He's an investor and he moved all his property to Florida. Oh, yes. Norris. Norris. Yeah. Bruce yes, Norris. I yeah. Know. He's so awesome. like when I want a little bit more local information and want to hear like his opinion on investing and like local market knowledge then I'll listen to him because bigger pockets more national. Mm -hmm. um, but then one of the things that I also um, try to reread every year that I really like is the book, Never Split the Difference. And that's oh. not necessarily to get me motivated, but also just to kind of help me remember techniques and strategies to negotiate with. Such a great book. Yes, yeah. I better read it again. You're yeah. right. And I like listening to it too, because when you listen to it, 
you could hear the intonation and the way that he says it and the way that like yes you can communicate versus reading it and you know got it oh great great stuff thank you jennifer mm -hmm. good job go ahead who is it's me. I just wanted to know how you present the buyer broker agreement and how you handle that. Um, so I don't actually use the buyer broker agreement all the time. The reason I used it in that case with Yvonne was they were so if so basically what I tell them is I go through my buyer presentation and I tell them that um, these are all the things that we do. This is why buyers choose to work with us. This is my commitment to you as an agent. And and sometimes I will ask, like, do you require us to sign something? And I probably should, but I don't usually. And I say, you know, I don't require you to sign anything. But I, as I mentioned, we do a lot of work for our clients. And in this market, it's very, very um, time intensive. So what I'm asking from you is to give me a commitment that if we agree to work together, I'm going to commit to finding you a property, whether it's on or off the market, but I also expect my clients to commit to working with me and just having that mutual respect for each other that we're not going to go off and do something else. And if you choose to do something else, all I ask is that you let me know ahead of time. And then they say, yeah. So usually, I mean, that's kind of the extent of it in that situation. Or if I know that like, they'll say, well, I don't want to commit to working with just one agent or, you know, we've been burned by other agents. And so we're going to just if you find us the deal, we're working with other agents. If you find us the deal, then I will say, so in that case, that guy was like, we're going to ask several different agents to find us. We're going to tell them what we're looking for and whoever can bring it to me can bring it to me. And so I basically said, no, I do require a buyer broker agreement. If you want to commit to me, I will commit to finding you a property. But if you don't, then good luck because I'm not going to spend a lot of time right now working with buyers that are not going to be 100% committed to me. So in that case, he awesome. said no originally, and then he came back and he was like, yeah, I'll, I can tell that you're committed and I can tell that your service is different. And then, yeah, he actually just texted me yesterday asking how I was doing. So yeah, it's really nice. That's so cool. Awesome. Thank you. All I right. Good you. job. Pa oh. Patricia, Patty. Oh. Thank you. Um, I was curious about how you decided to purchase in Pennsylvania and did you get an apartment building or something? Um, so my husband does most of the out of state. So like if it's in California, I'll find the deals and then I'll um, work those. But if it's in Pennsylvania, it's pretty much all my husband. Um, I think the re so if you ask me any numbers, I have no idea. But if um, the reason that he chose there is he felt like that was a good distribution center to all of the other, like where all of the other states are and their ports of distribution. So he liked that. He felt like there was a lot of growth opportunity there. Um, and so, yes, we don't have like one big building. It's a lot of um, three, six, eight. I think we have 120 something like that but it's a lot of smaller units that add up that's really cool thank you yeah. thanks <laughs> good job excellent okay let's unmute ourselves please and let's give her a big giant as usual when we uh when we're done interviewing like this we kind of go around the group and find out what we've learned. So we're gonna do that right now. Take a few minutes with that. We'd love for you to stick around, but if you have to go on an appointment, we totally get it. So thanks again. Thank um, you. Thank what did we you. learn today? What did we learn from Jennifer? I, I, I'll say something. First of all, Jennifer, congratulations. I you are the you. best, the very best. I think for Jennifer, she studies the market very well and she studies first, think it through first how it's gonna work. In a way she's analytical, you know, but she's amiable. Uh, <laughs> could you tell with her smile? <laughs> so I have to say that she really, really studied her business very well. And I know how she is, she really, 
looks at the ROI too, the rate of return on her investment, especially when you're doing the, um, the farming. So good job. That's really good, Jennifer. Thank you. Good, good work. Okay, what else did we learn? Go, go ahead, Robert. So Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing with everybody. You are, uh, you are definitely an example to a lot of good things that we coach about and stuff like that. So you don't know this, but we use your name a lot. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in not in oh, so so thank you for that uh the two things that i mean i got a lot but the two things is when you asked her about the pre-listing package and you said do you think it gives you a leg up on your competition her answer was i don't really know what my competition does and mike talks about all the time that you're not in competition with other people you're just in competition with the goals that you set for yourself and she's just focused on being the best Jennifer Matsumoto she can be. Not, oh, what's this agent doing? What's this? It's, I don't care what you're doing. I'm going to constantly step my game up to be the best I can be. And when I do that, I'm probably going to beat you. So it's just that mentality of just be the best you can be. And the second thing, you didn't talk too much about this, but I do want to point this out because I do your numbers once a month or every so often I send you those numbers. And her day, your average days on market is probably the lowest in the company in terms of your listing. So very impressive on knowing your numbers, getting people to price it right, doing the marketing stuff. When you go on a presentation, you definitely get it done very good. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. Okay. Other, what else did we learn? Anyone else want to share? Share, share. Raise your hand or just speak up, please. So, go ahead, Donna. Unmute, Donna. I think it, that she has a really good blend of the old school and the new school ideas. And I don't think she's gotten too much into the Tom Ferry, uh, what do you call it, uh, social media stuff as much as farming maybe which is also um, a Mike Ferry thing. But I think uh, it's just great that she started out small in her farming area and then built up to the thousand homes and that she's able to door knock a thousand homes and call around the farm area. Works well, works well, for sure. Um, other things that you uh, learned today? So I'm going to share something I learned. I've, I actually, when Jennifer said it, it occurred to me that this has been said different ways by a lot of different top agents, but it's a very consistent message. And we really have to take this home because I do believe it's part of top agent activity work. And that is, Call them before they call you. Call them before they call you. And every problem we have in this company is because the agent, excuse me, the client has not heard from the agent. Every problem stems to that communication. So, I mean, it was just like in my face. We have a few agents in our company that clearly do that. And Jennifer, I think is a really one of a shining example in that way. And uh, we need to take that home. Thanks Jennifer for, that was my big takeaway today. Did a great job, congratulations. Really Thank cool. you. Very Thank proud, you. very, very proud of you. Um, okay. Let's give her a big hand. Thank you very much. Say, <laughs> what? I want to say something what I learned from Jennifer. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I was just going to say, um, I wanted to say what Neil just said, you know, call them before they call you. But Jennifer put it the way, um, like, you know, always try to go above and beyond put herself in their shoes. Mm -hmm. um, she also said, if, you know, 
if a client, a seller, can keep the house, and um, they would, uh, she would recommend, yeah, it's a good investment, just keep it. Just uh, like treat her relatives, you know, her mother, her sister, that kind of um, um, really care. Um, I think that's what I really learned today. Because for me, if somebody wants to sell, I always try to push them to sell. I seldom say, oh, if you can keep it, why don't you kill? you know, keep it. If they want to sell, then I will sell for them. So that's kind of match what Neil told us before too. So, you know, we'll earn more business from doing that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Good Thank job. You. Okay. Can I thank her now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, give her a big hand. Good job. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Awesome. You're the best. Thank you.